on DD India. Live from New Delhi, you're watching GD India News R, India's voice to the world. I'm Siddharth Bharatwaj, coming up in the next hour. In one of the deadliest attacks on northern Israel, Hezbollah's rocket attacks claim seven lives, even as US calls for diplomatic resolution to Israel Hezbollah conflict in Lebanon. In United States, tight presidential race between Democrat Kamala Harris and Republican Donald Trump as both try to win over undecided voters. The Indian stock market gets ready for the annual Mohurat trading session. A special one-hour event from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. this evening. India prepares to face New Zealand in the final test at One Kere Stadium, Mumbai today. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi celebrated Diwali with soldiers deployed on the India-Pakistan border in Gujarat's Kutch. DD India's Abhishek Bose brings us more. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi visited Gujarat's Kutch to celebrate Diwali with border security force personnel deployed on the India-Pakistan border. Prime Minister Modi offered sweets to the soldiers. PM Modi pressed BSF Jawans for keeping India's borders safe and secure despite challenges. Prime Minister also highlighted country's rapid strides in exporting defence equipment to several nations of the world. Aaj Vikrant jaisa made in India aircraft carrier desh ke paas hai. Aaj Bharat mein अपनी सबमरीन बनाई जा रही है आज हमारा तेजस फाइटर प्लेन वायु सेना की ताकत बन रहा है पहले भारत की पहचान हथियार मंगाने वाले देश की थी आज भारत दुनिया के कितने ही देशों को Defense Upkaran export kar raha hai. Prime Minister also stressed that his government will never compromise with even an inch of India's land. Aaj desh mein ek aisi sarkar hai jo desh ki sima ke ek inch se bhi samjhota nahi kar sakti. Ek samay tha जब डिप्लोमेसी के नाम पर सरक्री को छल से हड़पने की पॉलिसी पर काम हो रहा था मैंने तब गुजरात के मुख्यमंत्री के रूप में भी देश की आवाज को बुलंद किया था आज जब हमें जिम्मेदारी मिली है तो हमारी नीतियां हमारी सेनाओं के संकल्पों के हिसाब से बनती है हम दुश्मन की बातों पर नहीं हमारी सेनाओं के संकल्पों पर भरोसा करते हैं this isn't the first time prime minister modi has celebrated diwali with soldiers since becoming Prime Minister in 2014, Narendra Modi has made it a point to celebrate Diwali with soldiers stationed in different parts of the country. He started this tradition in 2014 by visiting Siachen, one of the toughest terrains in the world. The next year, he visited the Punjab border, followed by Sumdo near the China border in Himachal Pradesh in 2016. In 2017, he spent Diwali with soldiers in Jammu and Kashmir's Gurez sector. In 2018, he visited Uttarakhand's Harsel and in 2019, he celebrated Diwali in Jammu and Kashmir's Rajauri. 
He also visited Rajasthan's Longewala in 2020. In recent years, Prime Minister Modi has continued this tradition by visiting Kashmir's Nausera in 2021 and Jammu and Kashmir's Kargil in 2022 and Himachal Pradesh Lepcha in 2023. As Prime Minister Narendra Modi celebrates Diwali with soldiers, it's a reminder that the true spirit of the festival lies in the bravery and sacrifice of those who protect our nation. Bharat Mata Ki. Avishek Bose for DD India. IMF's Geeta Gopinath shared a video on Thursday featuring the White House military band playing the prayer Om Jai Jagdish Hare as part of Diwali celebrations. The White House hosted a Diwali celebration to honor the contributions of Indian Americans to the US-India bond. Recently, the American First Lady Jill Biden and President Joe Biden hosted a Diwali celebration at the White House on October 28, inviting Indian Americans from across the United States to attend. This was the couple's last Diwali celebration as President and First Lady. Over the years, the Biden's Diwali celebration has added a unique touch to this luminous tradition. Addressing the White House Diwali celebrations, the US President said, extended Diwali greetings to the people, highlighting its significance and acknowledged that today the festival is proudly celebrated in the White House. The United Arab Emirates has transformed into a vibrant celebration of lights and culture as the Hindu festival of Diwali sweeps across the nation. The festivities have evolved into a countrywide event embracing all communities. In Burt, Dubai, locally known as Mini India, residents have been preparing for weeks, decorating homes and shopping for traditional items. The gold markets reported significant crowds during Dhanteras, the auspicious day for purchasing precious metals. Educational institutions across UAE joined the celebrations with students and teachers wearing traditional ethnic attire. Major landmarks across Dubai have organized special events. Al Sif Global Village and Festival City Mall are hosting fireworks displays, while shopping centers and local businesses have introduced Diwali themed promotions and decorations. The festival, while maintaining its traditional religious significance, has emerged as a symbol of the UAE's multicultural fabric bringing together people from various backgrounds in a shared celebration of light and unity. It's just amazing being here. There's so many different cultures, especially I love, this is my favorite one, the Indian one. All the foods are delicious, the jewelry, the color, the lights are amazing. It's just such a great feeling around here. Meanwhile, the festival of Diwali was also celebrated by Indian diaspora in Sri Lanka. Lamps, lanterns and fireworks were lit to mark the triumph of light over darkness, good over evil and knowledge over ignorance. And U.S. pushed for a diplomatic resolution to end the conflict between Israel and Hezbollah as a rocket attack by Hezbollah on Israel claimed at least seven lives. The victims were agricultural laborers. Hezbollah said it had launched several rocket and artillery attacks against Israeli forces. Israeli air defenses intercepted rockets fired from Lebanon as the IDF continued its campaign against Hezbollah. Meanwhile, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said there has been progress on an understanding of requirements for the effective implementation of UNSC Resolution 1701, which calls for withdrawal of Hezbollah from Israel-Lebanon border. This would be the basis of a diplomatic resolution uh, to the crisis. It's important to, uh, to, to make sure that we have clarity, uh, both from Lebanon and from Israel, about what would be required under 1701 to get its effective implementation. The withdrawal of Hezbollah forces uh, from the border, the deployment of the Lebanese armed forces, the authorities uh, under which they'd be acting, uh, an appropriate enforcement mechanism. 
Days after Israel launched airstrikes on Iran, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu warned that Israel has the capability to reach anywhere in Iran should the need arise. Israel today has more freedom of action in Iran than ever. We can reach any place in Iran as necessary. The supreme goal I gave to Israel Defense Forces and the security branches is to prevent Iran from achieving a nuclear weapon. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin discussed opportunities for regional de-escalation with his Israeli counterpart, Yoav Gallant, during a phone call. Austin also reviewed prospects for a hostage release and ceasefire deal. In a statement, Gallant's office said that the Israeli Defense Minister briefed Austin on the success of Israel's strikes on Iran and also discussed strategic opportunities. And DD India correspondent Akshay Dongre is joining us live to give us more inputs on the same. Hi, Akshay. A very good morning to you. Um, first of all, could you tell us about the current situation when it comes to Israel-Hezbollah conflict? Well, uh, the current situation uh, uh, remains uh, quite grim, uh, Siddharth, mm -hmm. uh, despite the assurances that we have uh, we have seen in recent days, uh, be it uh, uh, the U.S. leadership or uh, you know the Secretary of State uh, Antony Blinken himself uh, yeah. when he uh, talks about the implementation mm. uh, of uh, these uh, resolutions uh, that came out after uh, the uh, uh, Lebanon-Israel war. Uh, so uh, the the uh, the situation is grim, also p particularly because. There are things that are being said, there are claims that are being made, but on the ground, the hostilities remain, uh, you know, at, at, at unprecedented levels. Mm -hmm. uh, we have recently seen uh, the kind of rocket attacks uh, have, uh, that have been carried out in the northern Israeli territory, which have resulted in the deaths of seven people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think so. After this, uh, Israel is going to uh, back down when it comes to military action mm -hmm. against Hezbollah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, despite uh, the, the new chief, uh, you know, making all sort of statements when it comes to uh, the, the war uh, that is going to continue against Israel, as he has claimed, or uh, the uh, the end of the conflict, it seems that uh, neither of the parties are, are uh, actually willing to uh, uh, you know let go of uh, the kind of hostilities mm -hmm. there are mm -hmm. and work towards uh, establishing peace mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it, it seems uh, uh, difficult uh, that uh, in in recent days especially uh, a serious effort will be made by either sides when it comes to uh, solving this particular conflict and what we can expect now after the recent strike by Hezbollah, which has resulted in seven deaths in northern Israel yeah. Israel yeah. to also step up attacks against Hezbollah uh, Hamas and 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 all, all the hostile forces it has uh, in the in the region. Okay, Akshay, um, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu warned um, that Israel has the capability to reach anywhere in Iran should the need arise. Uh, how do you assess this? Well, it's quite practical, Siddharth, because in, in the recent days when we saw uh, the reports that came in from uh, from uh, West Asia, hmm. where Israeli jets flew uh, thousands of kilometers to uh, strike uh, the Iranian targets in Iranian territory, mm -hmm. uh, Israel does have uh, a super capability uh, to uh, project its forces anywhere in the region, especially uh, if not around the world. Uh, because uh, when you look at uh, the uh, the kind of technology that Israel has, it has has a uh, fifth generation stealth fighters, it has stealth uh, helicopters, it has a lot of stealth technology, it has, uh, you know, a state of the art uh, 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 weapon uh, uh, missile defense systems, it has state of the art uh, uh, missiles that it has already gotten uh, from the US or it has already um, um, uh, developed a manufacture on its own. Uh, but uh, the game changer aspect of uh, the firepower capabilities of Israel has been the fifth generation at 35 aircraft that it has in its arsenal, which do not show up on radar mm -hmm. so uh, it clearly shows uh, that uh, there is there is no country in the middle east right now in west asia right now that has the counter to the kind of technology uh, that uh, the the israeli government or the israeli people have uh, so yes they do have in fact uh, uh, you know uh, the the okay. uh, options right. of uh, projecting their forces anywhere in the region as per their own wish all right thank you so much akshay we leave it there and still to come on dd in the news hour and in Georgia, opposition seems not happy over latest poll results, calls for protest.
In Moldova, the court recognizes a result of EU referendum. We tell you more on the devastating floods in Spain. I'm Siddharth Bharadwaj. Donald Trump and Kamala Harris along with their running mates J.D. Vance and Tim Walls are on the final leg of their campaigns with just days left until the U.S. presidential election. Trump is campaigning in New Mexico and Nevada while Harris is holding events in Arizona and Nevada. Both the Republican and Democratic camps are confident of winning the Oval Office with polls predicting a close race. Early voting has already started showing a steady turnout in many states. Vice President Kamala Harris warned supporters at a Phoenix rally that Republican Donald Trump and his allies would scale back Obamacare and other health care programs if he wins the White House and said his comments at a rally were offensive to women. And on top of that, Donald Trump still wants to get rid of the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare. And he has a powerful friend in Congress, the Speaker of the House, who recently said, if Trump wins, there will be, quote, no Obamacare, which would throw, understand the meaning of that, it would throw millions of Americans off of their health insurance and take us back to the time which we remember when insurance companies could deny people with pre-existing conditions. Well, we are not going back. We are not going back. Meanwhile, Republican presidential nominee Donald Trump flew to New Mexico on Thursday for a campaign stop in a state he lost by 10 percentage points in 2020. Trump specifically quoted a Latino voters at the rally and said that the, he expects fraudulent voting in Tuesday's election, echoing his false claims of fraud in 2020. You know, on the East Coast, they like being called Hispanics. You know this? On the West Coast, they like being called Latinos. So, poll, a free, give me a free poll. You know, I don't have to spend $300,000. First is going to be Latinos, next is Hispanics, right? Which do you prefer? Latinos. Uh-oh. Uh, let me give it one more shot. Latinos. Hispanics. With just a few days to go for the election day of U.S. presidential polls, all eyes are on the way swing states are expected to play. Georgia is a key swing state in these elections. Dear India correspondent Shubhendu Ghosh in conversation with Dr. Jeffrey Lazarus, an expert on American politics. They discuss political dynamics of Georgia, concerns around political discourse and the persona of uh, Donald Trump and Kamala Harris. We are in Atlanta, Georgia, a state that is expected to play a key role in deciding who the next president of the United States is going to be. To talk about it, I have with me a U.S. politics expert from Georgia State University. Professor Jeffrey Lazarus, thank you for joining us. Uh, sir, if you could first uh, help us simplify the political dynamics of Georgia that makes it such a crucial state in these elections. So, as you probably know, the United States has an electoral college system of electing the president, and the states where um, uh, there are about equal number of Democrats and Republicans play the most important role. And that's because the candidates actually have a chance of winning those states rather than the lopsided states, which we know in advance are going to 
go for one candidate or the other. So Georgia is one of those states where there happens to be roughly equal number of Democrats and Republicans. Um, and so um, we're one of the states that could decide the outcome of the election. Right. And wherever we've gone to uh, register the early voting, we've seen a trend that the numbers have been high uh, as compared to uh, the recent past. Is this record number of early voting politically significant? What do we infer from it? Well, the main thing we can infer is that there is a record level of interest in this race. Um, the stakes are very high because of who the candidates are. And as a result, more people are interested in voting than ever before. Um, it's really difficult to infer whether this is favorable for one candidate or the other, um, because we just don't know who's voting. Yeah, Dr. Lazarus, thank you very much for speaking with DD India. Professor Jeffrey Lazarus talking about the political dynamics and the trends just ahead of the big election day on November 5th, which will decide the next president of the United States. The camera person, Jay Shankar, Shubhendu Ghosh for DD India in Atlanta. And DD India correspondent Shubhendu Ghosh is joining us from Atlanta to give us more updates on what's happening in the United States. Hi, Shubhendu. Uh, you are there since so many days and uh, we are seeing some wonderful reports by you. Um, I'll, I'll talk to you about the U.S. elections, but first just tell us uh, about some Diwali celebrations there in the United States very quickly. Right, uh, uh, Siddharth, uh, Diwali celebrations, in fact, uh, uh, at many places just concluded a couple of hours ago. Uh, uh, Atlanta time, it's uh, about 11 uh, p.m. Uh, at night, uh, and we just witnessed some Diwali celebrations uh, a short while ago. Also, many will continue over the weekend. The trend is that uh, they, because it's not a public holiday in okay. every state mm. like New York, mm. uh, a lot of these celebrations are reserved for the weekend. So uh, we'll see many big celebrations happening on Saturday and uh, Sunday as well. But Indian American community uh, really coming together to celebrate uh, Diwali. Definitely, Shubhendu. All right. Uh, now tell us the overall feel of the upcoming polls there. Uh, Shubhendu, and how is the campaigning going on for both mm. Trump and Harris? Just few days left for the, for the polls. Uh, that's right, uh, Siddharth. If I can quickly tell you about uh, uh, Georgia, it's, it's a very, very uh, closely fought state by both Kamala Harris and Donald Trump. Both have uh, campaigned uh, very hard in the state. It's an important swing state. Mm. If we uh, see the uh, demography, uh, the uh, black American population, the conventional Republican uh, voter base, uh, they're really pitted against one another. And therefore, it's such a close contest and difficult to uh, predict. If you talk about the current campaigning, uh, both Donald Trump and Kamala Harris are in far west, uh, Nevada and mm. Arizona. Mm. Those are, again, swing mm. states. We see the candidates putting in all their energy and efforts in the swing states that are likely to determine uh, the outcome of the presidential elections. For now, we also see these candidates engaging in a lot of damage control, a lot of uh, uh, political discourse, which is problematic, uh, has been practiced in the past few days by both sides. And we see the candidates trying to uh, really uh, shield themselves from the negative impact of it. But swing states holding the key and just a few days to go for the big election day now. Siddharth? Definitely, uh, Shubhendu. Uh, Shubhendu, what are the main issues that uh, voters in Atlanta are focused on this time around? Well, if you take a look at it, Siddharth, uh, the issues broadly that we've been talking about for the past many weeks, whether it's immigration, whether it's uh, cost of living, the economy, uh, the hugely sensitive issue of abortion, mm -hmm. also the conflicts going on outside of America, where America is invested in a significant manner, those are common issues across uh, uh, the states of United uh, States of America. Mm -hmm. uh, but these swing states, it is not a unique issue. But it is the demography, it is the difficulty in predicting uh, the outcome, difficulty in predicting which leader has uh, more supporters and therefore mm. which leader is expected to uh, sweep the electoral college votes mm. is what makes uh, these swing states uh, particularly interesting. Uh, but the issues, as I mentioned, those are the key issues, not just in swing states, but whole of America. And both the leaders have uh, put forth uh, very sh sharply different positions on those. So it's a sharply divided, polarized mm -hmm. elections. Mm -hmm. We'll have to uh, see uh, against whom the polarization yeah. would work and who will it support. Uh, you're in Atlanta right now, um, uh, Shubhendu. You must be talking to uh, you know, people out there. What are they saying? Uh, which way is the wind blowing as of now? What is your analysis? 
when you talk to them? Uh, uh, that's an interesting question, Siddharth. Uh, we really, again, we get a sense of the swing state very clearly. Mm -hmm. uh, we come across supporters of either Kamala Harris or Donald Trump, and they're mm -hmm. very confident about uh, that their candidate is uh, going to uh, win. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that is what they also say to opinion uh, poll okay. makers, and therefore this has emerged as a, a swing state is difficult to predict. But okay. uh, at the same time, uh, there are uh, these undecided voters, which mm -hmm. in every state, especially swing states, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it goes up to a percentage of about, say, uh, 5 to 7 percent undecided mm -hmm. voters who have not made up their mind or perhaps who don't intend to vote. Mm. Uh, their decision is going to be very, very crucial. A few hundred votes could make a difference in who takes the, the swing states and all the electoral uh, votes with it. And therefore, uh, it's very, very crucial to uh, read the mind of people who really haven't spoken on their choices yet. And, and it is believed to be a neck and neck fight, Shubhendu? Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's, a, it's a very, very uh, closely contested election and therefore the tensions are also on the rise, uh, uh, Siddharth. All kinds of allegations are being made. There's a lot of pressure mm. on the authorities conducting the polls as well. Their security has been heightened. There have been reports of uh, the poll uh, authorities getting threats uh, and therefore uh, different arrangements like uh, drone uh, monitoring, bulletproof uh, glasses. Authorities say it's mm. quite unprecedented in the manner in which the security apparatus for the poll authorities has been uh, uh, stepped up. Uh, so in that sense, uh, the tensions are expected to rise uh, uh, till one knows uh, what is the outcome yeah, of the yeah. elections. Definitely. Shubhendu, you, um, uh, you know, Trump quoted Latino voters at a rally and said that he expects fraudulent voting in Tuesday's election. Uh, what efforts are being made to ensure fair voting in the election? You just told... Uh, you know, you told us some things which includes drone surveillance as well. Uh, some other things which are being done by the government to ensure fair voting in the elections? We, we have to see, uh, uh, Siddharth, also that it is uh, the time for political campaigning and all tricks in the book are uh, put to use. Hmm. Uh, these allegations of uh, potential fraudulent voting are also seen as uh, very often pressure tactics by candidates to okay. put additional pressure on the opponent, okay. to put pressure on the polling agent. We know mm. from the past that there, there may have been cases of mismanagement, but large-scale case of election fraud or uh, election stealing, uh, as Donald Trump had also claimed in the year 2020, when he uh, lost by a, uh, by a close margin to uh, Joe Biden, mm -hmm. has not been really proven. But yet again, we see these allegations on the rise. Mm. Uh, so uh, the poll officials, of course, are doing everything they can uh, to ensure okay. a free and fair polling. Uh, but in the election season, uh, these sort of pressure tactics are quite common. And uh, we see Donald Trump practicing them a bit more than perhaps Kamala Harris. Definitely, Shubhendu. Seems like the intensity, intensity in fact, is really, really high uh, ahead of the elections. And, uh, you know, both the candidates are trying their best to woo the voters. But uh, thank you so much for your wonderful analysis. We'll keep taking updates from you, uh, you know, since it's just a few days left for the U.S. presidential post. Thank you so much. We'll leave it there. And uh, former U.S. President Donald Trump has strongly condemned the violence against Hindus and other minorities in Bangladesh. The Republican presidential candidate has vowed to strengthen his ties with India and Prime Minister Narendra Modi, whom he called a good friend if he was elected again. In a Diwali message, Trump extended his greetings on the occasion and accused his Democratic rival and Vice President Kamala Harris and President Joe Biden of ignoring Hindus in the U.S. and across the world. In July, August, several members of the Hindu community in Bangladesh were attacked by mobs after a student's agitation over a controversial quota system turned into a massive anti-government protest, which resulted in the ouster of Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. And still to come on DD Indian News. Clashes erupt during protests in Mozambique. Kenyan court lifts a block on deputy president replacement. Japanese scientists say launching world's first wooden satellite can be greener for space.
watching DD India News. I am Siddharth Bharadwaj and a quick recap of the headlines. In one of the deadliest attacks on northern Israel, Hezbollah's rocket attacks claim seven lives, even as US calls for diplomatic resolution to Israel-Hezbollah conflict in Lebanon. The Indian stock market gets ready for the annual Mohurat trading session, a special one-hour event from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. this evening. India prepares to face New Zealand in the final test at 1K Day Stadium, Mumbai, today of the three-match test series. And let's take a look at other stories making news around the world. Mexico has repatriated pre-Hispanic colonial artifacts from the U.S. It includes a piece of Chupicuaro, which is an ancient culture from western Mexico. The piece represents a painted woman and is very similar to the emblematic piece of the K. Branly Museum in Paris. In Germany, dozens of costumed people visited Buch Konigstein Castle for Halloween event for the first time in 46 years since previous location. Frankenstein Castle is undergoing extensive renovation. All Hallows Day or All Saints Day was when Catholics honored their saints. For Metropolitan Opera Orchestra violinist Sarah Fonzatel will be playing at a polling station in New York City. Fonzatel is one of the thousands of volunteers who are part of play for the vote. It was started in 2020 by Boston-based Celeste Mike Block to improve people's voting experience and to help musicians engage positively amid divisive rhetoric and political tensions. Residents in the southern Mexican town of Pomoch participate in annually in a centuries-old tradition of cleaning the bones of their deceased relatives, a tribute to the dead in the run-up to the Day of the Dead. Local folklore says that the spirit of a Pomoch native may become irate and wander aimlessly through the streets if their remains are not properly cared for. Three Georgian opposition parties have called for street protests, saying the election was rigged. As an exit pollster said, the official result was statistically impossible. The Georgian Central Election Commission announced that the ruling party Georgian Dream won the election with 54% of the vote. The opposition and the president of Georgia, Salome Zurabishvili, called the results fake and the prosecutor's office launched an investigation. While the election commission has insisted the vote was free and fair. Monitoring missions has pointed to severe allegations of voting violations, which Western countries said must be fully investigated. Georgian opposition leaders said sustained protests were key to their plan to challenge the election result. Molova's president has hailed a historic step after top court recognized the results of October 20 referendum, paving the way for the country to join the EU. The six judges of the Eastern European Nations Constitutional Court ruled with a majority of votes that the criteria for validating the referendum have been met. Moldova's 20 October referendum on EU membership held alongside presidential elections passed by a majority of 50.35%. The referendum and as election held on the same day were marred by allegations of election meddling. Thursday's court decision paves the way for Moldova to change its constitution to affirm its push to join the 27-nation bloc as a goal. The ruling comes just days before a second round of presidential elections in which Moldova's pro-European president Maya Sandu faces pro-Russian candidate Alexander Stoya Noglo. In eastern Spain, the death toll from devastating flash floods has climbed to 158 on Thursday with rescue teams still searching for those missing. The floods have battered Valencia's infrastructure, sweeping away bridges, roads and rail tracks and submerged farmland. Hundreds of soldiers have been deployed to Valencia to assist with operation. More rain is expected to fall on Friday, posing risk of new flooding. Spain's Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez has urged residents to stay at home as he warns devastation is not finished and declared Valencia a disaster zone. Opposition politicians accused the central government in Madrid of acting too slowly to warn residents and send in rescue teams. While the Interior Ministry said regional authorities were responsible for civil protection measures. 
The tragedy is already Spain's worst flood-related disaster in over five decades. And meteorologists say human-driven climate change is making such extreme weather events more frequent and destructive. Hundreds of Ecuadorians marched on the streets of Quito on Thursday for an anti-government protest blaming President Daniel Noboa for an energy crisis. Ecuador's worst drought in over 60 years has plunged the hydropower-dependent country into an energy that has seen power outages of up to 14 hours daily. The crisis has diminished reservoirs, leaving hydroelectric dams offline, pushing the government to impose power cuts to limit the stain on electricity supplies. This week, the National Assembly approved a bill proposed by President Daniel Noboa that seeks to expand direct private investment in projects generating up to 100 megawatts, up from the current allowance of 10. Police are in the streets after protests broke out before and after Mozambique's Electoral Commission announced that ruling party had won an October 9 poll, which extending its 49 years in power. At least 10 people were shot dead and another 63 injured by gunfire during post-election protest in Mozambique last week. Despite Mozambique blocking social media access for a second time in a week, protesters took to the streets across the south southern African country, which has promised to crack down on disorder. Turkish opposition supporters protested against the arrest and removal of the office of a mayor from Turkey's main opposition party for alleged links to a banned Kurdish militant group. Ahmed Ozer, mayor of Istanbul's Asenyurt district and a member of the Republican People's Party, or CHP, was detained on Wednesday by anti-terrorist police over his alleged connection to the Kurdistan Workers' Party. Turkey's government on Thursday replaced Ozer with Istanbul's deputy governor, Osgur Ozel and other politicians described as a coup. The mayor's arrest comes as Turkey is debating a tentative peace process to end a 40-year conflict between Kurdistan Workers' Party and the Turkish state that has led to tens of thousands of deaths. Kenya's High Court has lifted orders barring the swearing in of newly appointed deputy president whose predecessor has launched legal challenges over his removal from office by impeachment. The High Court clears the way for Interior Minister Kiture Kendiki to assume office as Kenya's new second-in-command. The legal team of his predecessor, Regati Gachagua, objected to the decision, claiming they were not given a fair hearing and that the court had sidestepped questions about Kendiki's qualification. Earlier this month, the Senate voted to uphold five out of 11 charges against Gachagua, including a gross violation of the Constitution. President William Rutter subsequently chose Interior Minister Kiture Kindiki as his new deputy, but a court blocked his appointment. The UAE's amnesty scheme for visa violators has been extended until the end of this year. The Federal Authority for Identity, Citizenship, Customs and Port Security, known as ICP, has announced a two-month extension now until December 31, 2024. The decision aligns with the UAE's 53rd Union Day celebrations and reflects the country's humanitarian values. It also responds to appeals from individuals wishing to legalize their status by either leaving the country or obtaining employment and modifying their residency status. The amnesty scheme, which began on September 1st, was initially scheduled to end on October 31st. The Director General of the ICP said this additional grace period represents the final opportunity for violators to rectify their status without incurring fines or facing entry bans. Once the amnesty period concludes, fines will be imposed on violators. The world's first wooden satellite built by Japanese researchers is set to be launched to space on November 5th in the early test for using timber in lunar and Mars exploration. Lignosat is developed by Kyoto University and home builder Sumitomo Forestry. It will head to the International Space Station on a SpaceX mission and will be released to orbit about 400 kilometers above the Earth in coming weeks. Named after the Latin word for wood, the palm-sized lignosat is tasked to demonstrate the cosmic potential of the renewable material as humans explore living in space. 
Lignosat was made of Honoki timber using a traditional Japanese crafts technique without a screw or glue. Let's take a look at other stories making news. Railways is making major changes in the rules for booking reserved tickets for trains from Friday. The advance reservation period in Indian Railways has been reduced from 120 days to 60 days from 1st of November. This move by India Railway will reduce the ticket hoarding issues and will make more tickets available for genuine passengers. India's Border Security Force Intelligence Wing carried out an extensive search operation and recovered one drone from farming field adjacent in Amritsar. The recovered drone is identified as China-made DJI Mavic 3. Authorities are now examining the drone's flight history and any possible attachments to uncover its origin and intended purpose. Devinder Singh Rana, a BJP MLA from Jammu and Kashmir and the younger brother of India's Union Minister Jitendra Singh, passed away at the age of 59. Devinder Singh Rana was uh, one of the key candidates in recently held Jammu and Kashmir Assembly elections. The late MLA was recently elected to Jammu region's Nagrota Assembly seat in Jammu region and was considered to be a strong voice for the region's dominated Dogra community. In Rishikesh, Uttarakhand, the banks of the Ganga shimmered in golden hues as foreign tourists joined in the traditional Diwali celebrations at Paramarth Niketan Ashram. In an atmosphere filled with devotion and joy, the tourists performed Aarti offering prayers and lighting rows of diyas along the riverside. The evening witnessed not only the flickering lamps but also the spirit of togetherness as tourists from around the world embraced Diwali's message of peace and harmony. And still to come on DD Minerva. Striking Boeing workers to vote on 38% pay rise deal. We tell you more on the IPL retention. Welcome to Chandika. You're watching DD India News Hour. I'm Siddharth Bharadwaj. And as the festival of lights, Diwali ushers in prosperity and joy, investors across India are preparing for a fresh financial start with a much anticipated Diwali Muhura trading session. More than a symbolic tradition, this unique trading window signifies the beginning of Sammat 2081, offering market participants an auspicious opportunity to lay foundations for a fruitful investment year. The Diwali Mahurat sessions on November 1st is viewed by many as a turning point 
marked by cautious optimism and strategic positioning. It's a bonanza for the economy as markets get a boost amid Diwali festivities. Traders are also more optimistic about making new investments. This report by DD India correspondent Anu Kaushik tells you about Diwali's role in India's growth story. India is celebrating Diwali, the festival of lights. The gala is marked by gatherings, shopping, feasts and exchange of gifts. Beyond the merrymaking, Diwali plays a major role in boosting the economy. The Confederation of All India Traders estimated a rupees 4.25 lakh crore or over 50 billion US dollars turnover this Diwali season. That's nearly a 10% increase when compared to last year. Several factors like rise in consumer spending have been the driving force behind the surge. From decorative items to sweets, markets are flooded with new and curated goods as per consumer needs. We have bought some Rangoli colors from these street vendors which are not actually easily available on the shops in the market. With a focus on vocal for local initiative, the festival is a boon for artisans as people buy handmade earthen lamps and idols. We meet these idols. The soil we use is considered pure. We make idols of Lord Ganesh and Goddess Lakshmi. According to a survey by community platform Local Circles, 40% of urban households spent most on home decor, 38% focused on beauty and fashion, while 22% chose gadgets. Responders also delved into their shopping avenues. 70% of the households chose malls and local markets, while 13% went for e-commerce sites. However, quick commerce platforms like Zepto and Blinkit that promise a 10-minute delivery recorded a surge in gift orders. The festival also provides a major fillip to real estate. Boosted by offers from developers, people flock to buy properties on this auspicious occasion. Sectors like hospitality and automobile also see a rise in demand. Then there's the generation of seasonal jobs. As for the stock markets, the festivities herald a new beginning for investors who rejoice at the special Diwali Muhra trading session. Diwali brings together friends and families. The celebrations also provide an opportunity for businesses, especially the local ones, to thrive. As markets witness high footfall, various sectors like tourism and retail benefit from the festive spirit, making Diwali one of the biggest occasions for the Indian economy. With camera person Vicky Rajput, this is Anu Kaushik reporting for DD India. Striking Boeing opens new tab workers on the U.S. West Coast will vote on an improved contract offer on Monday, which includes a 38% pay rise over four years and a bigger signing bonus. More than 30,000 factory workers who produce Boeing's strongest selling 737 MAX commercial jet and other planes have been on strike since September 13th and have rejected two earlier offers from Boeing. Talks between the two sides were held this week with the assistance of acting U.S. Secretary of Labor, Julie Su. The union vote will come the day before the U.S. presidential poll. The strike has halted production of its strongest selling 737 MAX jet and its 767 and 777 white bodies. And you're watching DD India News. Our time now for sport. India will be desperate to bounce back in the third test against New Zealand starting on Friday in Mumbai. New Zealand have already clinched the series after winning the two matches of three test series. They have climbed to fourth position in World Test Championship. Kiwis must win their remaining four tests to secure a place in the WTC final. Following the India tour, New Zealand will play a three-match series against England at home. Meanwhile, India finds itself in a tricky situation after losing the series on home soil. This defeat has significantly impacted their chances of reaching the WTC final. India must win all six remaining tests in this cycle to secure the top spot. If they lose any of these games, Rohit Sharma's side will need other teams vying for the top two spots to falter. Well, the fast bowling duo of Jiral and Marco, both included in South Africa's squad for the four-match T20 series against India. The series is scheduled to take place from November 8 to 15. The pair return after injury layoffs, while Henrik Klaassen, Keshav Maharaj 
and David Miller were also included in 16-man squad. Top bowler Kagiso Rabara has been rested for the series along with Lungi and Giri as South Africa look ahead to the two-test series against Sri Lanka, which begins later in November. The T20 matches against India start on November 8 with matches in Port Elizabeth on November 10, Pretoria on November 13 and Johannesburg on November 15. As the deadline for the retention of players ended on Thursday, all Indian Premier League franchises have revealed names of their respective retained players ahead of the mega auction. Chennai Super Kings have retained MS Dhoni as uncapped player, while Rohit Sharma and Hardik Pandya both were kept by Mumbai Indians. Delhi Capitals have made the bold call to cut Rishabh Pant from their lineup and decided to keep Aksar Patel as their main pick, while Royal Challengers Bengaluru have retained Virat Kohli. Indian teenage shuttler Rakshita Shri Santosh Ramraj pulled off a stunning victory against world number 25 Christy Gilmore to march into quarterfinals of the Hilo Open in Saar, Saarbrücken, city of Germany. In fact, uh, Rakshita eliminated the tournament second seed in the state sets 21-14, 21-12 in the women's singles pre-quarterfinal match. She'll take on eighth seed Julie Daval Jakobsen of Denmark in the quarterfinals. Other than Rakshita, Malvika Bansod, Ayush Shetty and Satish Kumar also advanced into the last eight of their respective categories, capping a splendid day for the Indians. Malvika defeated Arena of Denmark 21-13, 21-16 in women's singles pre-quarterfinal encounter and Malvika will face fourth-seeded Thuy Lin of Vietnam in her last eight fixture. In the men's singles, Shetty Cruz passed Giovanni Totti of Italy 21-13, 21-9, while seventh seed Satish Kumar defeated Harry Huang of England 21-12, 21-15. Home hopeful Hugo Umbert dumped, dumped world number two Carlos Alcaraz out of the Paris Masters in the round of 16 with 6 1 3 6 7 5 upset win. Umbert got off to a blistering start, breaking Alcaraz twice to secure a 5 0 lead before wrapping up the first set in just 26 minutes. The four time Grand Slam winner Alcaraz grew into the game, fighting back to take the second set. Umbert held his nerve in tense third set, breaking Alcaraz on match point to seal a stunning victory and advanced to quarter-finals where he will meet Jordan Thompson of Australia. Meanwhile, Alex de Menor ended British number one Jack Draper's seven-match winning streak with a 5-7-6-2-6-3 win. De Menor has now equaled his personal best season wins, total of 47. Both Rune and Dimitrov reached the Paris Masters quarter-finals with tough wins. Roon struggled against French lucky loser Arthur. However, Danish 13th seed Roon recovered from a set down to win 3-6, 6-3-6-4. We wind up this bulletin with some celebrations that took place at the iconic Dakshineshwar temple near Kolkata where Shama Puja took place last night. Kali Puja festivities reached a crescendo with devotees thronging the temple to catch a glimpse of the deity and all illuminated. That's all for this edition of DD India News Hour. But let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. For those on the go, you can get all the latest news and updates from India and across the world on DD India mobile app. The app is available on both Android and iOS platforms and you can scan the QR code on the screen to download now. We'll be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I'm Siddharth Bharadwaj from all of us here in Delhi. Thanks for watching DD India News Hour.